Amen. Hey, good morning. Man, I am happy to be back. I was gone last week. You probably didn't even notice because Pastor Brandon did such a great job preaching or teaching last Sunday. I watched online with joy, but really happy to be back with you this week. And uh, as Pastor Dan mentioned, um, I am allergic to Iowa. It is official. And as I was in Arkansas, every vehicle down there was green in the mornings because of the pollen, and I was fine. But I drove back north on Thursday. Uh, when I got into the Iowa, across the Missouri-Iowa state line, I started getting a tickle in my throat. And by the time I got to Des Moines, I realized I'm allergic to whatever trees we have up here, and I haven't been able to talk well since. A blessing to my wife, but going to be difficult for you guys today um, as I rasp at you. So I'm going to do my best. We uh, are fresh off a week of watching my granddaughter, Emery, two and a half years old. Uh, my son and daughter-in-law went to Florida. They said, here's Emery, uh, keep her alive, return her to us in the condition that we give her to you. No scratches, no dents, no issues. And we had a blast. I mean, Joy and I, both in our 50s, um, keeping up with a two and a half year old that's got to at least have the energy uh, of three two and a half year olds. And um, we uh, divided and conquered. We played man to man. We played zone. We had a blast with her. Looked forward to nap times. All you moms out there can give a little amen. Nap times were the best part of the day. Um, when she finally went down at night, Oh, but then you sit and watch the monitors because you never know what's going to happen. So a week of vigilance, and uh, we had a really, really good time with her. I did uh, tea parties with her. She did dress up. We watched all sorts of princess movies. I went to gymnastics with her, and um, I was educated in how to think like a two-and-a-half-year-old. They negotiate like a terrorist. They do not negotiate. You, I try to negotiate. I'm a reasonable man, and I'm like, Emery, if you do this, then I'll do this. And she'll be like, okay. And so I'll follow my end of the deal. And I'm like, Emery, it's your turn. And she'll say, uh-uh. And every time, and I fell for it like three or four times and then finally figured out she's not gonna keep her deals. And I learned how to communicate with my granddaughter. But we had a blast. It was so much fun. Happy to be back. Week number five in love intentionally. And today we're gonna talk about a concept that's really simple. One that's so simple that I almost skipped I almost skipped it because it almost seemed too simple to bring to you on a Sunday morning. And um, many people who preach this series or teach a series on 1 Corinthians 13, they do that. They lump it in with a bunch of others because it connects in theme to a number of other themes or descriptions of love that the Apostle Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 13. 15 different descriptions of love that make up the concept of agape. Agape being the kind of love that is not based on experience. It's no matter what it takes for as long as it takes because it's the right thing to do. It's not the kind of love that bails out early, not the kind of love that comes in late, not the kind of love that looks for what's in it for me. The kind of love that's willing to do, to give, to see, to embrace, to engage just like Jesus. 1 Corinthians 13, as a reminder, beginning in verse four, love is patient. How patient are you feeling today? Pretty patient? Just give me a little nod. I can see most of you out there. Not patient. All right. Um, love is kind. How are we doing with the kindness? That was, you know, week number two. Kind, are people feeling kind? A little bit? Okay. Doesn't envy, doesn't boast, is not proud. That's what Pastor Brandon talked to you about last week. Today, we're going to be talking about verse five, the very beginning of verse five. It does not dishonor others, but it's not self-seeking. You know that. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth and always protects, always trusts. Can you believe that? Always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I fail. And you probably fail too. Now, failure is an event, not a person. And just because we have failed to love like Jesus doesn't mean that we are failures and we cannot learn to love like Jesus. So this series is all about loving intentionally because love is only meant to be understood as it's in action. It's only understood when expressed. And today we're gonna to talk about a really simple concept. Love does not love, does not dishonor others. Now, dishonor others doesn't mean that you're insulting their mom or that you're challenging them to a duel or that you're besmirching somebody's character. I mean, I guess that could be part of it. But literally what love 
does not dishonor others means is, is, and I told you it's simple, didn't I? So simple you're going to want to skip it. Don't skip it because it will land if you allow it time. Love is not rude. And we, friends, live in the renaissance of rudeness. We are a rude and friction-filled society that repels people based on our behaviors, our actions, sometimes even caused by attitudes, our sense of entitlement. And we, my friends, are rude. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not rude. Love is filled with grace, filled with concern for the effect that we have on the world around us. I see my life and your life like a boat going through a lake. We'll say Sailorville Lake because it's the best we got. And as the boat of your life is going through the lake of this world, it leaves behind it a wake. Can't drive a boat through a lake without leaving a wake. And the wake is largest and affects the most the people who are closest to you. But the ripples continue out from your life all the way to the shore. And they're felt for a long, long time. So to prime the pump, we're going to talk about behaviors that are rude so that we all know we're guilty, but then we're going to transition to uh, an application that's very, very spiritual, that's very, very personal, and it comes from the book of Hebrews, but we're not quite there yet. So let's look, and in your notes, you'll see the top 20 rudest behaviors in America. Uh, I Googled it, so you know it's true. And I actually compiled three lists. You might find yourself on this list, but I'll read the top five just for, um, because it's fun, right? Number one, Using your speakerphone in public is rude. Anybody that, did anyone use their speakerphone in public? Raise your hands if you do. Shame on you, you're rude. That's rude of me to call you out, isn't it? Yeah, um, that's a rude behavior apparently. I don't generally do that. Um, it would be rude if you're talking to somebody on speakerphone and they don't know they're on speakerphone, I suppose. Number two, interrupting. Is that rude when you're talking to somebody and they just, they interrupt you? They finish your sentence? Oh, I know what you're thinking. It's rude. Stop it. Number three, talking with your mouth full. <laughs> Spitting on people as you're, sorry, I got you. I did the front row. Um, there were table manners. There were a bunch of table manners, right? Chewing with your mouth open like a cow. <laughs> um, putting your elbows on the table when you eat. My grandmother was a big manners person. And uh, my dad's mom, and she taught me manners, table manners, which forks go where, and I forgot all of them, which is rude of me. But she made sure that I knew anyway, and I knew better, which I guess is part of it. Number four, standing too close to people in line. Does anyone else hate that besides me? I hate that. Do not stand in my personal space. I would also include standing in somebody's personal space when they're talking to you. You ever talk to somebody and they get right up in your grill and they're talking and you can smell what they've had for dinner yesterday and, and, and you just want to back up, but you take a step back and what do they do? They take a step forward and you step back and they take a step forward and pretty soon you're pinned against something and they got you and you can't get away and it's rude. So don't, don't do that. Being late, that was number five. And um, I was going to ask some people in the first service what their number one rude characteristic was, but they were late. No, I'm just kidding with you. They, I'm just kidding. I'm taking on first service. I did ask several friends um, before church, before the first service, you know, name a rude characteristic that you, um, you know, you would point out. And they said being late. That was on almost everybody's list. Your time's more important than my time. I'm sitting here waiting on you being late. Um, there are other ones. You can see other ones. One of my, I'd put on the list. It's not on the list. It's, it's blowing your grass clippings in the, in the road when you mow your grass. Now, this started some controversy after the first service because there were some people in there who did it, and I challenged them to a duel. Uh, to a, when you drive a motorcycle like I do, when you drive over grass clippings, it's like ice sometimes. When you drive a Jeep like I do, and the top is off, and someone drives through the grass clippings before you, the grass clippings fly up in the air, and they land in your Jeep and on your clothes. And so I'm wearing your yard, and all I did was drive by your house. It's rude to do. Blow your own grass clippings, right? Um, Joy and I were at Walmart in Arkansas, so consider the fact that we were in Arkansas Walmart, um, trying to park. 
And uh, we were driving down an aisle to find a parking place. And there was a lady who was walking to her car in the middle of the aisle. And she was walking slow. She was doing the old lady shuffle, right? Don't lift your feet up, just shuffle, shuffle, which is fine. I don't mind, right? I'm glad that she's walking. I'm glad that she's shopping. But then she stopped in the middle of the the, the aisle and she wouldn't move. And she looked down at her phone and I guess she was answering a text. And I waited for five seconds and I looked at my wife and she said, don't. Now, I don't know what she thought I was gonna do, (laughs) but... She was probably right. I timed it because after all, we're trying to be kind, right? And kindness gives 10 seconds. And so I gave 10 seconds. She didn't move. 20 seconds later, start revving the engine. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Couldn't, probably couldn't. I don't know. She didn't hear. And I sat there. That was rude. Sometimes we were, were rude people. We were just, we're rude. Rudeness is an epidemic in our culture, but it's also an epidemic in our churches. Rudeness among the Christian community. Discourtesy. And we're going to talk about that in the second section that we're together. Now, we're going to jump over to Hebrews because in the book of Hebrews, we're given a list of instructions or explanations as to how we're supposed to live in a Christian community. How we live together, having come out of the world, in their case, it was out of religion and legalism and judgmentalism and all of this, but for us, it's out of the world and into the church and how we learn to live together. And the author of Hebrews is talking about something very personal, then he's talking about something very practical, and then he's talking about something that's much more public. All three of these things are parts of being a believer, parts of being a Christian, All three of these things are really important, but the last one is what deals with rudeness, and it deals with courtesy and grace. We're going to get to that one in the second section of the teaching time. So read with me Hebrews 10, 22 through 25. Let us draw near to God with sincere hearts and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The first instruction that we are given by the author of Hebrews is to draw near to God with sincere hearts and to live with the full assurance that faith brings. This is talking about the guiding principle of your life. The one thing that governs who you are, how you want to be perceived, and the legacy that you leave behind. The one thing. What do you want to be known for? Who do you want to be? I want to be known for my faith, and I hope you do too. Now, the the original hearers of this letter, this Hebrews, they were counting on their own good works, their own intelligence, their own pedigree. I was born into a religious family, so I'm probably going to be okay. Well, I'm pretty good. When I get to the end of my life, my good works are going to be balanced against my bad works, and so I'll probably end up making it in. Or, you know, I'm pretty smart and I've kind of figured out a way to, to piece together different, you know, religious aspects and, and, and kind of made peace with God. And so they were relying on themselves. And the author is saying, listen, you need to remember that it's by God's grace and your faith that you have been freed from the penalty and consequences of sin, from aimlessness in this life, and for a destiny in separation from God in hell forever. That if you've been saved by God's grace and through your faith, that you have been set free, that you are a new person, that you've begun to live a new life. So you hold fast to that and the assurance that it gives you that you've been freed from who you used to be and you've become something else. So we are supposed to draw near to God 
and to hold on to our faith. Now, the author of Hebrews moves on to the second point because he knows, as do you and I, that life gets really tough, that things happen. Oftentimes, it's a person who will disappoint or wound, wrong, victimize, a circumstance that you didn't anticipate, maybe something you brought on yourself, oftentimes something that just seems to happen out of nowhere. Life was fine one minute, and then it begins to fall apart. And you don't know why, and you don't know how to fix it. So you do what everybody else does. You look to God and you say, why? If you love me, surely this wouldn't happen. If I was your child, surely you would make this go away. And the author of Hebrews says, listen, I get this. It's going to happen to you because it happened to the fathers of our faith. It's happened to every believer who's ever become a Christian from the beginning of time until now. And so he prepares us for this. And he said, listen, I want you to hold fast, unswervingly to the hope that you possess. And the hope is not used the same way that we use hope, right? I hope it's going to happen. Hope is a reality based on facts. The facts are that we've been saved by our faith in God's grace, that our sins have been forgiven, that our lives have been given meaning and that God has a plan, that as we live our purpose, it leads us toward our destiny, which is our future that's guaranteed in heaven. And friends, that's our hope. It's the principle that supersedes, that trumps all of the circumstances or people that may tempt you to swerve in your faith. But have you ever been tempted to give up your faith? to walk away because of something that you have gone through. Are you tempted right now, either here in this room or online, to swerve? Are you tired? Are you disillusioned, frustrated? Well, God gets it, and he wrote about it. And the encouragement is, Draw near to God with your faith and hold on to your hope and don't swerve. You can do it because God is faithful. And you see, it seems almost impossible to draw near to God in our faith and not to swerve when things in life get chaotic because I can't see my life objectively and I get caught up in the circumstances and I get emotional and I get, and the author of Hebrews, well, he has something to say about that. He gives us that, that solution and we're gonna talk about it when we come back together in just a minute. But before we do that, if you are struggling, if you have swerved and it's all you can do, or could do to even just get here today. I want to pray for you. If you are tempted to swerve, that there's something going on and you find yourself wavering, I'm going to pray for you because God guarantees that he will give you strength even in the middle of life's most difficult circumstances that if you don't swerve, you hold on to your hope and with an undivided heart draw near to God through your faith, that God's going to lead you through. But before we do that, can I ask you to do something? I know in my life that there are people who I love who are struggling in their faith. And one of my responsibilities as a believer, and you'll see this in a minute, one of the ways that I can be considerate to them 
is to encourage, to reach out. And I want to ask you to do the same thing. Maybe you in your life, you know somebody. Maybe it's a son or a daughter, a sibling, a parent, a coworker, friend. Somebody that you feel is going through it and they have or might be beginning to swerve. Now, we're not judging because we've been there. We're not pointing fingers because we don't know how hard their life is and what they're going through, but we can come alongside. So I'm going to ask you to do something that I don't often do. I'm going to ask you as we close out this teaching time and we begin our time of singing to take out your cell phone and I want you to send a text to the person who you know that may be struggling. Do not make it churchy and please don't make it weird. No King James English. No platitudes. Something in your own words that's simple. I see you. I love you, and I'm praying for you. Would you send it to somebody? And then we're going to continue our time together. Because all of us need a little help when we get tempted to swerve. Well, Joy and I have had a lot of conversations lately about people like the lady in the Walmart parking lot who stands there staring at her phone and won't move. Um, you know, my response is, surely she has no idea that there are people waiting. And my wife, who's probably more realistic, and in this case, as in many cases, probably right, says, oh, no, she knows exactly what she's doing, and she just doesn't care. Now, there's a difference between not knowing what you're doing and knowing what you're doing and just not caring. Um, I heard it just this last week, I heard it said that when you're dead, you don't know you're dead, but everyone else around you grieves. Um, the same thing is true when you're rude. Sometimes we don't know we're rude, but everyone else around us grieves. And they pay the price. And so in our relationships that we have with each other, the one another's, with the world around us, it's important to try to live as frictionlessly as we can because the gospel is buried in here and can only best be seen through a life as it comes out through the cracks and people see Jesus in us. So the more friction-filled we are, the harder it is for them to see what's important, which is the purpose of our life. But there's a much bigger issue that I wanna to talk to you about today. And it comes from Hebrews chapter 10. And it's the third issue or command, characteristic, if you will, of a genuine Christian. And I want you, whether you did not know up until this point, or whether you knew but did not care, to consider that the author of Hebrews, inspired by the Holy Spirit, God, is giving us instructions on how to live at peace with ourselves at peace with each other, and ultimately at peace with God. The first instruction or the first characteristic that was described was to hold fast or draw near to God with our faith. The second one, to hold unswervingly to the hope that we possess. The third one is sort of a compound instruction, and it starts with some really simple words, to be Consider it or consider. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, the word spur is a lot like you might imagine if a person's riding a horse, which I have ridden horses before, but no one has ever trusted me with spurs on a horse. But I have seen somebody spur a horse, and it doesn't look particularly pleasant for the horse. Um, and that really is the, the word. It's a word that's an irritant. It's a word that's like a prodding word, a word that is um, many times used in a negative connotation. But in this case, the author is saying, let us consider how we can be considerate of each other so that we can be in a position 
to help encourage or spur them toward the point of our lives. To love God, each other, and the good deeds that comes from living a life this way. Let us be considerate and let us think about other people and realize that I have a responsibility to someone other than myself or maybe the five or six people who I spend most of my time with. That when a person becomes a believer, when they've confessed sin, believed who Jesus is, pledged to follow him as Savior and Lord to become a disciple, that we have been adopted into a spiritual family. And we're not only children. And sometimes we feel like we become sons or daughters of God, and we're the only child. And that all that matters is just this, 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 this. But God has created us in a way where we are interdependent on each other. And that's the way he made us. So what I'm saying to you and what I'm going to communicate to you next is not coercion or guilt to try to help build a bigger church. It's part of a blueprint for you as you live out your salvation and become the people who God has intended for us, for you to become. You see, some people feel like we have a spiritual problem. We're just disconnected from the Lord. There's just something missing. There's just something not right. And in reality, the problem is not just a spiritual problem. It's a problem in that we're lacking community, that we're refusing to live interdependently, that we think that we're only children of the king. And we live in disrespect and disregard rudely toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is something that you may never have thought of before or never been told before. But I wanted to suggest it to you because I believe it's true. And, and I just want you to let it land and then you decide what you want to do with it. Church is not a place where you go. And you see, this is what the author of Hebrews is, is getting toward. Because he says, let us consider how to spur one another on in love and good deeds. Don't forget, don't forsake, don't take lightly the opportunities to get together with other believers. Because when you do, you encourage one another. And by the way, Jesus is coming again soon. The author of Hebrews is saying that church is not a place where you go, where you try to get what you want. And if you don't like it, you go somewhere else. And you can show up when you want and do what you want and take what you want and leave. The church is not a place where you go. The church is an identity that you embrace. That we are the church. And that when we come together and don't take lightly, the getting together and encouraging one another, living in close enough proximity where I can spur you without you rejecting me, where I take responsibility for you and can help you when you begin to swerve, and you help me when I begin to swerve. The author says, yeah, we're going to draw near to God in faith and we're going to hold unswervingly to this hope. But he says, consider each other in love and don't take lightly. Don't give up on how important it is to be the church and to be the church like this in a gathering. And I'm going to tell you something that I know is true. And I don't know how it's true. I just know that it's true. And that is that God does things in you when you are in a group that he does not and will not do in you when you're by yourself. And many people try to substitute 
the family of God, considering ourselves as only children, or maybe a very small family, and we put everything else in as a substitute to the gathering. And God allows us to do it and says, okay, go and try that. Try it with your children, try it with your family. See how it goes. And when you come to the end of yourself and realize that something is missing, then perhaps you'll consider putting yourself in proximity with other believers. Not taking lightly the getting together on a regular basis. Where church is not a place that I go to consume, but it's a group of people as we share an identity as the family and body of Christ. And then finally, we begin to be healthy. In Corinthians, the church, man, they were not healthy. As we've talked about, turn in the Lord's Supper into a popularity contest with certain invitations given and certain people excluded. A competition of who has the best spiritual gifts yelling over the top of each other. Inconsiderate, rude. But one of the most rude things that I could do to you and inconsiderate things that I could do to you is to take you lightly and to take this lightly because we are the body of Christ, the church. One of the most rude things that you can do is to take each other lightly and to take this lightly, to forsake it, to disrespect it, to to minimize the importance of, to say to God, you were wrong, I will live the way I want to, and I will put any and everything in place of what you've asked me to do because I know better than you do, God. And then we work backwards. You begin to swerve. I know it, you know it. It's just the truth. And we don't like it because we like to think we're independent, but we're not, we're interdependent and God created us that way. You can't fight against the person God created you to be. And when you begin to swerve, then instead of drawing near to God in your faith, you find yourself adrift with your salvation still intact, but faith being a distant memory. And you look at the things in your life that used to be right and make sense. And all of a sudden they don't. Because the organizing principle has slipped away and you're living somebody else's life. So the author of Hebrews tells us that if we want to be loving, that we consider each other. One of the most rude things that I can do is to dismiss you. You ever talk to somebody, you're in a conversation with them and they're always looking over your head and shoulder, trying to see who else they're gonna talk to, who's more important. You ever, you ever have that experience? Anyone? Nobody's ever had that experience? Is it just me? Where people are talking to you and you're, they're just looking at the room and they're waiting for somebody. I don't know who they're waiting for. Somebody else, somebody better, somebody different. And you just know that they're not engaged in the conversation. I was talking to a friend of mine, Nate, just a few minutes ago. And he said, one of the most rude things that, that I can do or that someone can do is when I'm talking to him on the phone. He has a family member who does this. He said that they're doing other things and they're not really focusing on the conversation. And if they're walking around, I can tell they're cleaning and I'm talking and they're just sort of, you know, lobbing the answers back and forth. And he says, finally, I just say, you know, call me back when you have some time because don't I deserve some time, some consideration? So here's the way we do it. It sounds very vague. First of all, we be present. That's easy. You did it today. You won. You're present. And presence is important. And there's two reasons why it's important. And this is where you have to decide if you're responsible for anybody but yourself. First of all, God says you need it, but that's not the most important reason. The most important reason is, is the people around you need it. Which leads me to my second point, which is to when you are here or in your city group or when you gather with other believers, that you're not just present, 
but that you're engaged, aware. Now, what does that look like? Some of you don't have the time to serve and work in the kids' ministry and be in the cafe. I mean, some of you do, and that's fantastic. Some of you are working toward that. But what I'm talking about is an awareness of the people around you. Walking in saying, okay, God, I'm available today. If somebody's starting to swerve, point that out to me. Allow me to be an encouraging word. Allow me to be a pat on the back. Allow me to see the people who are around me, not to be rude and dismissive and point my feet the other direction and look behind and see who else I can talk to. Allow me to consider how I can spur my friends on toward love and good deeds. Not making light of the getting together of the saints as so many are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another because Jesus is coming again. And if we don't do it, how's the world going to see it? It's going to disappear. When we were in Arkansas last week, my wife and I, just the two of us, as I mentioned, with a two-and-a-half-year-old. Now, for you moms, not a big deal. You do it all the time, right? No big deal. You're like, what are you talking about? I'm old. I told you. They're fast. I'm out of practice. It was a big deal. Lots of fun, but do it again. Big deal. We're in Arkansas. I look at my wife. Three days into a seven-day stint. It wasn't prison. It was just, you know, hanging out. But we were counting the days down because we wanted to make sure we got it right. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, there are lots of rules. You've got to follow them all. And I said to my wife, I said, what do you want to do today? And she said, it doesn't matter what I want to do today. Now, she didn't say it like, you know, she had a chip on her shoulder. She didn't say it like, you know, well, uh, I can't do whatever I want to do. She said, it doesn't matter what I want to do today. And then, then she said, it doesn't matter what you want to do today. And I said, why not? She goes, because we're on a mission. And she goes, we came here to do something, to accomplish something. And that is to invest in this little girl. So it doesn't matter what you and I want today. What matters is that we do what we came to do. And that her experience, that's what's important. And do you know by giving ourselves away and living vicariously through this little tiny terrorist who doesn't negotiate well and doesn't even listen, we had such a great time. And we were tired, but it was the best kind of tired in the world. And we didn't say, you know what, today I just don't really feel like feeding Emory. I think I'm going to go do something for me because we're family and she needed me. And when we're there and she wants to talk, and even though sometimes it was jibber jabber and I didn't know what she was saying, instead of looking past her, I engaged, I was present, I was trying to understand and ask questions and tell her how wonderful she was. And the third thing we do, and it's super simple, you're present, you're engaged, and then we're polite. We look to each other to see how we can better the experience for the people around us. Because friends, you and I are on a mission, and it's the mission that God has called us to that will make us a little tired but in the best possible way. And the only way you can become the person God wants you to be. The only way we can become this person is when we assume our rightful responsibility and role within the body of Christ. Some of you are brand new. And some of you have been here a long, long time. But there's a next step for everybody. And I don't know what that next step is, but I'm nudging you and encouraging you to take it. One of the things that I've done to try to help, and I hope it helps, is I have written for you five days of um, devotions again, like I did a couple weeks back. And then Brandon was here last week, and so I didn't do it last week while I was on vacation, but I did it again for you this week. On Monday, tomorrow, if you have our app downloaded to your phone, you will receive a push notification at 7 a.m. that will have your Monday devotion, which will talk about drawing near to God in faith and what that looks like. We're going to be talking about things that you may be thankful for about your salvation, and I won't give any more away. On Tuesday at 7 in the morning, you're going to get a push notification that will take you to a short devotional thought that I've written for you on holding on to hope, on not swerving and not quitting. And I know some of you sent a text at the end of the last section when I asked you to. But some of you didn't. And some of you who didn't knew you should. And so on Tuesday, I'm going to give you another opportunity to do that. Tuesday morning, 7 a.m., right in the middle of the devotion, I'm going to say, stop, send that text. 
to help somebody in your life hold on to their faith. On Wednesday, you're going to get the top 20 rude list again, and you're going to be able to add to your own or add your list, your rude stuff to your list. And we're going to talk about trying to be frictionless so that the gospel can better be seen in our lives. On Thursday, we talk about what it means to be a responsible part of the family of God. And on Friday, just in case you're unconvinced and God forbid you wonder what's in it for me, I'm breaking down Psalm 92 for you. And I'm going to give you three benefits from the author of the Psalm through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that will remind you how important it is to take these things seriously. Because friends, love is a lot more than, but never less than, not being rude. Next week, we'll pick up with another theme, and I can't wait. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent together. And I pray that you would, uh, wherever the message needs to land in our lives, um, I pray that it lands. The church is not a place where I go that I can take and leave when I want to, substituting anything else. but an identity that we embrace where my presence, my engagement, my consideration is important as I assume my responsibility as a child of God and a member of the family of Christ. And it's a big step for a lot of people. And I get that, Father, but I pray that you would nudge us that you would spur us on as we take the next step, whatever that is, toward the center and our transformation and our change, becoming the person you want us to be for your glory, to become more like Jesus. And I pray for my friends. And as we go through this week together, each day, digesting a little piece that you would allow it to take root and that when we come back together again next week, we would be changed. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.